Awesome, guys. So let's get started so we don't get delayed. First of all, thank you uh, for coming to this presentation. I know you guys are coming back from lunch and you've been maybe sleeping now, but I'll promise I'll make it work, okay? So uh, this presentation, I named it, it works on our machine. I guess maybe you guys have heard it in the past, right? It works on my machine, so it should be working on yours, right? So the idea here is to show you guys that when you work with containers, it can work in all of our machines. But you need to understand first how to work with containers, and that's the idea here. It's not a very technical presentation. The, the audience here is most for operator guys, the ones who are starting the, their journey with containers. So you can understand how you can create your own containers and then migrate that workload to an orchestrated solution like Kubernetes on top of OpenStack, for example, okay? So what are the topics that we're going to discuss today? I separated it in five different topics, okay? First one, where are you getting into? Let's discuss about what the idea behind this presentation. Then the alphabet soup. Let's discuss some terms, some terminologies, and some acronyms that the industry uses when we're talking about containers. Also, containers, what? What is a container after all? Then the containers recipe, what a container is made of. And also containers practices, some recommended practices when you work with containers so you can use it at, it, at its fulliest, okay? And if we have time, I'll try to do a quick demo showing you how you can build these containers by hand, then using external tools, and then migrate the same application that I'm going to run in my laptop to an orchestrated solution, okay? So let's get started, but before that, uh, let me present it to you guys. This is my first time speaking here at the Opening for Summit. It's a pleasure for me to be here. I work for Red Hat for about five years now as a TAM, Technical Account Manager in Brazil, Latin America. And right now, I'm the only TAM in Latin America that works with customers that runs OpenStack and SAF. So to me, it's a very good day to be here with you guys discussing these kind of topics, okay? So let's get started. What are we getting into? Well, this presentation, as I just explained to you, aims to show you how you can create standalone containers, basic containers, explaining what it is, and then taking that container to an orchestrated solution, right from a laptop to that. And why is this for you? Why are, are you guys here? First, to better understand the concepts and terminologies surrounding the use of containers, then to get a better view of what's under the hood and demystify some of this concept, you know. Remember some commands if you are used to work with containers and some processes and useful tools to handle these containers. And finally, get an overview of how a container can move for, from one host to that orchestrated solution. Instead of every time saying orchestrated solution, from now on I'm going to refer to it both as Kubernetes or OpenShift. That is the Red Hat's version of Kubernetes, okay? So let's first, talking about, let's first talk about the alphabet soup. What I mean by that? Well, I like very much this phrase. Some people credit it to Albert Einstein, okay? It says that if you can't explain it simply, you don't understand it well enough. And why I liked it? Because, let's be honest, guys, we are tech guys. We love fancy words to describe some other things that already exist doing some things and use buzzwords to describe that same thing, right? And that's one of the problems in the industry because there are a lot of these words that confuses the operator, confuses the developer. And if you are confused about that technology, about that feature, you won't use it, you won't use it as it should be used because you don't understand it at its fullest. So the idea here is to make it simple. Let's use basic words to describe these things, these magical things such as containers and some other stuff, okay? So the basic vocabulary when we talk about container. First, first of all, the container itself. What is a container? Well, putting in simple words, container is nothing more. Uh, first of all, uh, let's uh, establish here that container, containers have two different states, okay? First, running, and then at rest, okay? So when a container is at rest, it's nothing more than a set of configuration files. It's nothing more than that. It could be, for example, a root deer with all of the binaries and other stuff that you need to run your application, okay? It's simple as that. But when you put this set of configuration files to execute in your operating system in an isolated way, so you have all those processes accessing these files, then you have a running container, okay? It's simple as that. So containers are nothing more than configuration files when at rest 
and isolated process in your system when running, okay? But when we talk about container, we also talk about images. Because imagine that you need to run that same application into a different host, into a different system. For that, you will need to export that same configuration files to the other system. And for that, we use images. Image is just a simple way to bundle all these configuration files together and export them to a different system, okay? But imagine that you have to store these images as well. And then we have the registry. A registry is a fancy word to describe a file system that is going, a file server, store, uh, sorry, that is going to store your container images, okay? In that file server, you're going to, to, to have a URL that you can use to access your images, to download that, to share that, and etc. Also, you have the concept of a pod. A pod is nothing more than a collection of two or more containers inside the same shared namespace, okay? Basically, what a pod does is to share the network namespace and some other namespaces, depending on what kind of pod you're running, okay? with all the containers that are part of the same pod. And I'm going to show you, if we had time in that demonstration, how that works, okay? Also, there are some acronyms in the industry about the use of containers. One of that is OCI, the Open Container Initiative. The idea behind OCI, this, uh, this project, is to develop standards and specifications for containers. And by specification, I mean runtime specification, image specification, and distribution specification. That means the way you should run your containers, the way you should package this configuration files to be distributed, the third part, okay? Because if you don't have that, there's no way to run containers in a seamless way across all nodes, right? And also, when we talk about containers, we also talk about the CNCF, the Cloud Native Computing Foundation. This foundation aims to promote the adoption of cloud native computing, including containers. So you're going to find a whole landscape of applications that uses container inside this foundation. And of course, the Open Infra Foundation, the same foundation that we are part now. Okay, what's the idea behind the Open Infra Foundation and containers? Well, we cannot talk about the same projects that are part of the Open Infra Foundation without talking about containers because most part of these projects now are containerized, right? We have a bunch of other uh, talks here since, since Tuesday, right? Uh, that talk how we can uh, build our applications using containers, how these projects communicate with themselves. Also, the idea of having, for example, OpenStack on top of OpenShift, all containerized. And the opposite is true as well. You can run your Kubernetes cluster on top of OpenStack. So to do that, you first need to understand how these things work together and how you can create your own application or you can containerize your own project to work as a container. And then you may be able to run it inside of OpenStack or Kubernetes, one on top of another, okay? So let's discuss what is a container. Well, I can tell you what it is and what it is not. First thing, container, it's not a virtual machine. Please, stop saying that. There are people that are still think that container is like some kind of different virtual machine, but it's not, because the very concept behind a container is that you won't virtualize all the operating system as you do when you're running a virtual machine. You virtualize all hardware, right? You virtualize the kernel and some other, some other parts of your system. You don't need to do that when you are working with containers because you use another level of virtualization, the OS level virtualization, okay? So you are sharing the same libraries, the same kernel, but you are separating some parts of the system. And by these parts, I mean the namespaces, the user space, okay? Also, containers is an evolutionary leap in how we develop, deploy, and manage applications. Since containers arrived, we see a lot of uh, older applications and new applications being refactored to work with containers because it's easy, because it's portable, it's one of the things, as we see there, it's lightweight, it's scalable, okay? But you need to understand how to break your application into these little pieces in order to work uh, in a proper way. And also, container, it's not a magic bullet. And I explained that in a few minutes why. So this is a basic image of a, a structure of a container, okay? You have your processes, and then below that you have your application code, and below that, you have the operating system with all the dependencies, 
packages, libraries, OS UTUs, binaries, and some other stuff, okay? But in order for you to run containers in an easily way, you would use, you, you'll use something called the container runtime, okay? That is a binary that is going to help you to uh, run all the processes that you need, mount all the directories that you need, and et cetera, for your container instead of doing it by hand. Okay, so using the container runtime, you can create, start, get state, queue, delete, etc. your container. And also you can run your container on your own laptop, on a server, on a virtual machine, on an orchestrated solution, whatever you want, okay? And as I said before, since you are not virtualizing all the operating system, all the kernel, some, some parts of it are being virtualized. So containers are portable. That means you can run that into your bare metal machine, like my laptop, for example, or you can run that in a virtual machine. That's the way I'm going to run it today, using a virtual machine. But hold your horses, not like that. <laughs> but <laughs> it's very important to understand some concepts behind the use of containers. One of that is that containers are the new kid of the block. Everyone wants to run containers, wants to work with containers, wants to containerize their applications, but for that, you need investment. You need people that have understanding about the use of containers. You need to change processes. You need to, to buy some things in order to make it work, okay? So you need to spend some money on that. So think about it when you suggest to do something like this to your company, okay? It needs investment. Also, this isn't one size fits all. That means that not all services are containerized. What I mean by that? There are some applications, for example, let's say a, a massive database that needs quick access to the hardware or high IOPS, for example. Or you can imagine some other types of applications that have strict security cons, uh, constraints and some other things. So this type of application not always are fit for being containerized, okay? So you need to understand how your application works, what are the limitations, what are the constraints in order to check if it is possible to containerize the application, okay? But we are seeing this changing today, okay? Most part of applications now are suitable for containers. There's just a small part of that are not. Also, as Uncle Ben said, with great power comes great responsibility. Because the more containers you have, the more complex it gets. So imagine that you're running a container into your laptop to be your own application. Easy, two containers, easy, 10, 100, thousand, that gets complicated, okay? So for that, you will need an orchestrated solution to take, to take care of all these containers for you, and not only the containers, but the networking part, the storage part, and some other things, okay? So think about it before starting to containerize your applications. Now let's talk about what comprises a container after all. What is it made for? So, going for it. Before we had all this tooling that we have today to create containers, we needed to do it by hand. And by hand, I mean using all this kind of stuff. To root, user space by using namespaces, okay? So groups, SLinux, Linux, SecComp, OverlayFS, and some other stuff, okay? So imagine yourself trying to build your own container only using this kind of tooling. And I'm not mentioning it all. There are more here, okay? It's possible, but it's not feasible. It's not practical at all. That's why some initiatives and some uh, solutions came up, like Podman, like Docker, LXC, and some others, to facilitate your work, okay? And also, you have some other things to build your own containers, like Duda, Scopio. I'm going to talk about them in a little bit, okay? So now, it's easier to work with containers because you have all these tools that do the hard work for you, okay? So, Talking about the, this tooling, this external tooling, as I, as I said. First, we have the LXC. It was, it was one of the first implementations of the containers as we know today, okay? It used the true root to separate mount points, to isolate mount points. But then we had an issue with LXC, with LXC in the first versions because true root, with an archaic way to do virtualization, the, the isolation, sorry. So the problem is, when you are under to root, you are able to use a privileged user to access other parts of your system, okay? So it's not good, because security, 
uh, thinking about security, okay? So that's why Docker came up, to solve part of that problem using a daemon mode, a client server mode, where you have a privileged process running all of your containers. And the daemon take, takes care of all of your containers. But that poses a security, security breach as well, because you imagine all of your containers running as root. That's not how it works today, okay? Uh, they enhanced that, and now it's possible to run rootless containers with Docker, but it was not always like that. And that's why the Podman initiative came up too, to solve that problem, because Podman doesn't work this client-server model, okay? You use the fork exact model, where each one of your containers are running with a separate process, okay? And they are not sharing the same namespaces. Also, Podman, it's full open source, differently from Docker right now, okay? So these are the three tools that you're going to use to manage a container, basically, external tooling, okay? Podman to run and manage the whole lifecycle of your container. And inside Podman, you have these other two tools embedded, Builda and Scopio, okay? But if you need to do something more granular, you would use Builda to build and mount your containers. And if you need to inspect the images, and if you need to transfer the image to different registers, you would go with a Scopio. Of course, there are many other tools that you can use for that, like RKT, like Cry, and some others, okay? I'm simply describing some of the most popular right now. Also, when you think about container, you need to understand that there are some best practice to follow, okay? Especially if you're trying to migrate your container, your workload, from your laptop to an orchestrated solution, like Kubernetes. So there is one strategy that is called lift and shift. I guess many of you have heard, okay? So lift and shift is basically to take your application, your workload as it is, and put it in an orchestrated solution, like that. You simply take from here and put there, okay? This is, this is one example. And there are pros and cons in doing that. One of the pros is the fact that you have a faster migration and a deployment speed. Also, you have very less work needed to move the application to a cloud infrastructure. But the problem is, with the lift and shift strategy, you does not use the native cloud form features to its best. And also, it's much more expensive to be operated on the cloud because you're not using the benefits of the cloud for your application. It's like taking a monolithic, monolithic application as it is and putting it on the cloud without breaking it into those little pieces, little pieces that I said before, okay? So what is the advantage of doing that? For some scenarios like legacy applications, it may be worth. But for the majority of these scenarios, you're going to go with a complete refactor of your application, okay? Because you're going to have higher performance and high level of optimization. And that's one of the examples that I'm going to show you in a few minutes, all right? So how would you do that? Let's take the application and put it on Kubernetes, on top of OpenStack, for example. Well, if you're running Podman, you would do something like that. You will simply run Podman generate Q, and specify the name of the file, okay, the name of the pod, and then it will generate a file, a configuration file, a specification file for Kubernetes, for you to run your application there. You can also test it using Podman Play Cube to see if it's working, okay? And in your uh, orchestrated solution, your cluster solution, you would run, in this example, I'm using OC, that's the binary corresponding to the kubectl, okay, for OpenShift, OC, new project, to create your project, and then OC create you know, you, the name of the file that you just created, okay, and it will create your application. Of course, it's not that simple. There are some tokens in the way, okay, in order to work properly. But there are some recommendations for you guys. If you're thinking about doing it, think about, first, the application reliability, okay? If you're going to refactor your application, then you need to keep your application configuration outside of the image. And why? Because otherwise, your image is going to be bloated. It's going to be huge. So it is important to make these kind of things outside of your image container, your container image. Also, specifying the resource requests and resource limits in the pod definitions so you don't uh, use all the resources that you have in your cluster, okay? Also, defining liveness and readiness probes, protecting the application with pod, Podman disruption budgets, ensuring that the application is terminated gracefully. This is really important. Also, run one process per container. It is possible to run multiple containers inside a pod, and for some situations, it is desired 
For example, if you have a proxy container, okay, uh, like a sidecar, for example. But for other scenarios, it's not the best practice to follow, all right? Also, implementing application monitoring, alerting, configure your application to uh, write logs to extend or out, extend or error, okay? And consider implementing resilience, resilience measures for your application. And when we talk about security, use it only trust-based container images, okay? Of course, in the community, you're going to find a lot of that, but if you're working with a specific vendor, check if that vendor has a, uh, a certified image for you, because that way you're going to have an image that was tested, okay? Also use the latest version of the base container images. Why? Because you have uh, erratas for that a version of container, okay? Separate the build image and runtime image, okay? You can have a build image only to build containers from it, and you can have a separate image only to run that container using that same image, because that way, when you update here, it doesn't mean that you need to update here, the runtime uh, container, okay? Also, stick to the restricted security context constraint where possible. And by that, I mean when you're running uh, your pod or your container inside Kubernetes, for example, there are some containers that we require to you to uh, elevate its privilege. It's the case of the demo that I'm going to do right now using WordPress, for example. But this is a small part of these containers, okay? Most of them should not run using privileged users. Also protect the communication between the application components using TLS. This is basic, guys, right? So let's go to the demo, and I'm going to show you how you can do all of that that I just said. So, I have here a virtual machine, okay, a Fedora machine, and in that machine, I just created, sorry, LS, I just created this root deer. How did I do that? Well, just for you guys to know, I created this script here to show you what are the packages that I'm running here, that I'm using here, okay? I use the DNF command, specifying the version of the Fedora that I want to use, and some other stuff, blah, 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 and the packages. See the list of packages that I'm, I have here, okay? And inside that, you can check here in this directory that I have a root tier, a basic root tier, all right? So what I did was to copy all, it, all this content to this overlay FS directory to simulate a container. Why? Because when I'm running like this, I'm using a lower directory to maintain the base, an unchangeable directory with all my files, okay? And then an upper directory where I'm going to make the changes that I need in my container, all right? And this is what Podman do, okay? And I created here this script to mount the directories that I need into bind that mount point into another mount point that I'm going to use as the base for my container. So you guys can see here a lot of work okay, that we need to do to create by hand a container. I'm talking about creating it with your creating directories, mounting that directories, exporting them, etc. And finally, to run that, I create this simple script just to facilitate my work, okay? But you guys can see here quickly what I'm doing. I'm just mounting, okay? Then I'm creating all the network part of it. I need to create uh, a bridge to make a communication between my host and my container. I need to specify IPs for both of them. I need to create an interface inside the network namespace. I need to set a VAF type, and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So these are the things that I'm doing here. Also configuring IP table rules to make my containers to communicate with my external world, okay? So you can see here a lot of things going on. So if I just run it like this, And I create, oh, I just ran it, ran it before, so I will use the restart option. And I create this to remind me that I need to run the unshare command in a different window. And why do I need to do this? Because the unshare command is the command that you want to run to create a containers by hand. If I run like this, for example, you guys, you're going to see that I have some namespaces here that are, going, that are being used by my operating system by default but I don't have any other namespace created by me, okay, manually. I'm going to do that right now using the unshare command. So that command that I just asked myself to run there is asking me to run 
the unshare command and specifying all the namespaces, networking namespace, user namespace, the process namespace, the UTC namespace, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. If you have questions about all the parameters, run the unshare command dash dash help. You see all the available namespaces. There are seven, okay? And then I'm specifying to root inside a bind mount point that I just created and I specify the bin bash uh, binary so I can, when I run it, I can enter my container running my bash uh, interpreter, okay? So I'm going to run it. I forgot to mount, I need to mount first. Let me do like this first. Now it's mounting, and you, you, and you can see here that I mounted, okay, We're using overlay FS like this, and now I can do the command again. This command here, it's mounted, and now here to access my container, and I'm inside my container now. And now I'm going to finish here. It says that my container is running and I should access using the 8081 port. Well, I need to do some tweaking here to mount what I need to be mounting here inside my container and also to run my application. In this scenario, I'm running a simple WordPress container. As you can see here, it started my HTTPD server, and if I go here and I update it here, voila, it's working. So I created by hand, I didn't use any of these Docker, Podman stuff, etc. Okay, I only use it scripts with all the operating system tooling. But you guys saw it that it's very hard to do like that. Okay, so another way to do it is by using this external tooling, as I said before, like for example, Podman. So if you guys check here, you're going to see a lot of other files that I created to facilitate my work as well to create containers using Podman. So in this case, I have this script to create a simple web application and this other one to create a pod using two different containers, as you can see here, okay? And as I said to you, this pod is sharing its namespace with these other two containers. I can simply run this, this script here or I can use Ansible to do it, okay? So if you guys check here, Ansible, you guys are going to see that I have specified the same parameters that I specify in that script, but now using Ansible. So, Ansible, Playbook, playbook, create. And it's creating my container, okay? And now I'm specifying a different port for that container, that container that I'm running using Podman, okay? So if I check here, this other tab in the 8080 port and I update it, it's working. It's the same application, the same data, okay? What I did was to export the data that I had in the container that I built by hand to this container running Podman using an image in the OCI standard, okay? But now, the hard part of it, take that same application that I'm running here and put it on an orchestrated solution like Kubernetes or OpenShift, for example. And by do, to do that, I'm here in a different tab. And as you guys can see here, I created a lot of different files. I, bro I broke my application into different little pieces, different configurations. Okay, and all of these configuration files, they do a different thing. Mapping my storage, to specifying the route for my container, to specify the service, the images that I want to use, etc., etc., etc. So, I created a script here. It's called create block script. When I'm running all these configuration files, okay, in order to run my container in that orchestrated solution. And if I run it like, run like this right now, it's going to create my container. And if I go here, for example, in my OpenShift, and check here the pods, you guys are seeing here that it's just creating my WordPress pod. And when it's done like that, and if I go here and update it, you guys are going to see the same application that I'm running here using Podman that I'm running here in a container created by hand. The, the only thing that I did here was to export a database of my application that are using my laptop and import it into the PVC, the storage of OpenShift for this application specifically, okay? Simple as that. So the idea behind this demonstration is to show you guys that it's possible for you to create applications into your laptop using containers, especially if you are working in an upstream project that needs to be containerized. And the 
after that, you can make this business working all together in an orchestrated solution like Kubernetes using OpenStack, for example. That's the idea, okay? So that's all for me. I'm on time. Thank you all, and if you have questions, I'm open for it now. Thank you, guys.